It's a brand new week, which of course means a brand new episode of Star Trek Picard. Episode 2 has been down for us, so let's warp in and check out the details. Hey everyone, my name is Captain Jack and welcome to Trek Central. Star Trek Picard Episode 2, titled Maps and Legends, has now aired on CBS All Access and CTV Sci-Fi Canada. If you're looking to keep up to date with all things Star Trek Picard, then make sure to subscribe to Trek Central here on YouTube. International viewers can watch Episode 2 via Amazon Prime Video on January 31st. As a heads up, our video here will contain spoilers for Episode 2 of Picard. Therefore, to avoid any spoilers, we recommend turning away now. With that out of the way, let's go! So we'll be breaking down the episode first, then moving to talk about our review of it. Before I do start however, I really want to get your feedback on what you personally thought of episode 2 so far. For me, this is a great step forward and certainly builds the world of the series even more. This is really needed in my opinion. While yes, we do know a lot about the universe of Star Trek, we don't know massive amounts about what happened during this specific time frame of Star Trek. This level of world building and additional details is really appreciated to build up the core and background of Star Trek Picard. Whether this be for the Romulans, Federation or Jean-Luc himself. Either way, I love it, and hope we continue to see some more attention to detail as we move forward with the series. And I expect we are. Jumping straight into our breakdown, the episode starts in a very interesting way. This is during First Contact Day on Mars in the year of 2385, the exact day of the attack on Mars. We see some brand new Starfleet starships in orbit which are protecting or escorting the Romulan relocation fleet. They look particularly interesting without a curved saucer, they remind me very much of some old John Eves concept art we've seen before. New Starfleet shuttles are seen, they're also based on some earlier John Eves concept art such as the V-Class. This class was actually seen in the hangar of the USS Enterprise E during some concept art and a Ships of the Line calendar from a couple of years back. It's apparent that because it's first contact day, only a skeleton crew is working on this specific section of Mars. When you think about it, with minimum personnel around the shipyards of Utopia Planitia, this would be perfect time for an attack. Combined with what we know from Children of Mars, the recent short trek, this would make sense. Finally, we're introduced to what everyone has been calling the F8 androids. These are the F series of androids we saw in the trailer and give off a very Bruce Maddox vibe to them. We see them get activated and start their job. We get a feel of how limited these androids are due to their interactions with the crew, not understanding jokes and acting much more robotic than Data ever did. This suggests they're not as advanced as Data which obviously makes sense based on what we learned from the end of episode 1. The specific android F8 returns to the crew compartment and then a flicker of light activates in its eye, probably due to being hacked or getting orders from somewhere, it's obviously an indication to us for viewers that something is changing inside it. The android moves to command consoles and manages to disable the security net. As alarms start to go off, one of the crew tries to stop the android but instantly gets his neck snapped, a little bit gruesome, with the android not even moving from his mission at the controls. This does give us a sense of how powerful just one of these androids is, so you can really see what they could have done to an entire planet if there's quite a lot of them. We do get the feel that there is quite a lot of them as we see containers actually having them housed in there. It is interesting. Now that the android has disabled, the synth picks up a laser cutter and guns down the crew, including Starfleet security who try and take it down. We see them in the uniform of the time, which we saw in the first tie-in comic, Picard Countdown. Now that the androids are destroying the shipyards and the base, the synth turns the laser cutter on itself and fires. Now the fact that it does this to itself is kind of interesting. It could have just let the fire and explosions engulf the planet later destroy itself. It makes me think that if it was hacked, then whoever hacked it didn't want its positronic net to possibly survive and contain any information that Starfleet might know who did it. A clean and simple solution if you will. The screen fades to black and we've seen another perspective of the attack on Mars. It honestly wouldn't surprise me if we saw more flashbacks to this attack as it's a core and central aspect of Star Trek Picard. Following the countdown comic issue 3, the status of George LaForge is still in the air, though maybe not. Returning to Picard's vineyard, we find everyone looking over the security feeds of the assassination of Daj. While analysing the feeds, Laj and Jaban say that they are not sure even the Tal Shah would have the audacity to attack Earth. Lars then tells us of a Tal Shah myth the Jat Vash. Most people see the Tel Shah as a secret police of the Empire. As she says though, you could put secret in front of anything Roman and it would make sense, so therefore secret police doesn't really mean much. The true secret police that hide behind the Tel Shah are the Jat Vash, 
a much older order. This order, the Zat Vash, in Romulan refers to the dead, for the dead are the best at keeping secrets. We also find out that the Zat Vash hate artificial life for some reason, specifically synthetics. That's why Romulans don't have androids and the computers and drones aren't very sophisticated. Lars and Picard manage to beam into Daj's apartment, however, on upon analysing the apartment, they find it has been scrubbed clean of any Romulan involvement. While attempting to find clues of the attack which claimed Daj's boyfriend's life, they investigate her personal computer. It very much reminds me of the holographic displays that can be found on the Odyssey class starship in Star Trek Online. The computer has been tampered with, which makes sense, but we find out that Daj and Soji are even closer than identical twins, actually being hard to distinguish between the two. While Laris is using some of her Telshia operative skills, they use the information as the computer mistakenly thinks that any calls Daj has made to Soji are calls to Daj herself due to them being identical. Following this conclusion, we find out that Soji is off-world due to the packets in their transmissions having been routed via subspace. Following this, we cut to the Romulan reclamation site, aka the Borg Cube. Now I can Soji have gotten closer, for lack of a better word, the most interesting thing we find out is that the cube they are on has been severed from a Borg collective, and that the Romulans make money from a Borg technology they extract from the cube. Moving back to Picard, he's paid a visit by his doctor, Moritz Benyon. It appears that they served together on the USS Stargazer, which was the first ship that Picard commanded. Jean-Luc's gotten a health checkup in order to be cleared for interstellar service by Starfleet. Even though Picard's health is above Starfleet's minimum for service, there is a problem with his parietal lobe, which is caused by a number of syndromes. This is probably due to Picard having Eomatic Syndrome, which we learned about in Star Trek The Next Generation episode, All Good Things. Eomatic Syndrome is a clear neurological disorder, which is eventually terminal. Despite this, Picard asks Moritz to clear him for active service, so he can go back out into space one more time. We make our way to Starfleet HQ, which is actually a shot at the Anaheim Convention Center. There are transporter pads, which Picard beams in on. They are a very neat idea, but I do wonder how safe they are. I mean, we don't want another Tuvix situation on our hands, and I don't think Starfleet does either. We do get a nice new look at the Starfleet uniforms, or some iconic Star Trek species such as the Andorians, all walking around going about their business. Now, as Picard walks into the building, above him is a holographic display of the USS Enterprise under Pike's command, and then the USS Enterprise D. Most likely, this is just on a shuffle and displaying the iconic Starfleet starships. Picard has a meeting with a commander in chief of Starfleet. Finally, after many months of this scene in the trailer, we do actually get to see it, as well as the scene of Picard getting his visitor's badge and having to spell out his own name. Kind of embarrassing, but funny at the same time. We meet Admiral Clancy, played by veteran actress Anne Magnuson. While researching this character, I came across a tweet from Anne which described the Admiral as the Margaret Thatcher in space. I mean, after watching this exchange between her and Picard, I think that's a great comparison. Fun little detail, there is a map of the galaxy in the background of this meeting. It shows that the Romulans still hold territory, despite the loss of their home planet and the collapse of their star empire. Now, Picard does want to be reinstated to go on a mission to find the missing Bruce Maddox. He tells the Admiral of the Roman operatives on Earth and how he believes Maddox has been creating flesh and blood androids. Now obviously the Admiral does not believe this and really goes in on Jean-Luc. They will not help him, especially because of his recent outburst during his interview in which Picard said that the Federation, and by extension Starfleet, no longer stood for what it once was. I imagine this must have caused heads to roll at the command levels and really embarrass the organisation. We do find out that a number of member worlds within the Federation didn't want to help the Romulan people, alluding back to what we heard in the interview in Episode 1. After the destruction of the Armada on Mars, they wanted to cut their losses and were threatening to leave the Federation if more aid was given to the Romulan people. It's particularly interesting as Picard uses the same tactic against Starfleet. He threatened to resign his commission in order to get Starfleet to continue helping the Romulan people, but the Federation chose their member worlds over Picard. Now obviously the Admiral denies Picard's request and simply tells him to go home as he no longer has any power within the organisation. She's quite brutal at telling him this, then again she does seem rather pissed off at him. Back to the Borg cube, Soji makes friends with a chul scientist called Nashala. I'm not going to attempt pronouncing her full name because honestly, I will butcher it. Yeah, leave it as you will. She says that her application for joining the Borg Artifact Research Institute, which is headed up by the Roman and Free State, took a bit of time getting approved, which Soji says that's no great surprise. Now this does seem to be the new name of the Roman and government, which I very much like. It almost alludes to the Roman Republic, which we see in Star Trek Online. 
It's very interesting. Now we also learn there is a grey zone within the Borg cube which is filled with XBs, which is the term used for the former Borg collective drones. Even though the cube is mostly safe, these researchers are given badges to signify when they're in dangerous locations. If the badges are flashing green, that could possibly equal a simulation. This isn't said, but it's kind of implied. Through signs on the wall, this facility has gone 5,843 days without an assimilation. Dating this back, it would be roughly 16 years. So this facility must have been here since the year 2383, four years after Shinzon's coup and two years into Admiral Picard's relocation mission into Romulan space. Narek approaches them before Soji can introduce her new friend, he already knows who she is. She comes from Trill Polytech. We know that the Chill Science Ministry is a leading centre of learning and experimentation, so having a polytech within researchers able to partake in this Borg artifact research is not surprising and it's kind of a bit more of that world building I spoke about. Narek explains to the two researchers that the cube has undergone a sub-matrix collapse, and as such, its connection to the Borg Collective has been severed. This is interesting to note, the last we saw the Borg was during the final of Star Trek Voyager, in which the Collective was dealt a crippling blow by Captain Janeway and the crew of the USS Voyager, through the destruction of a Borg transwarp hub. Now it would be obvious they're still kicking around, but maybe not anywhere in the Alpha Beta quadrants. Narek asks Soji if he can watch her work, to which Soji says that he needs permission from a director of a Borg reclamation project. Now as she walks away, Narek says to himself, actually I don't, which weirdly make me laugh, the scene certainly suggests that Narek holds some sort of higher power that he's not letting on to. Cutting back to Picard's house, Dr. Agnes Girardi has arrived in his study. She's been researching Bruce Maddox and the data left behind. She makes note that Bruce Maddox and data were friends in a fashion, this can obviously be seen in the Next Generation episode Data's Day, in which data records one of his days for Maddox. We did theorise in episode 1's speculation and breakdown that most likely Data could have sent the painting of Darge aka Daughter to Maddox, therefore enabling Maddox to base Darge off of the painting. She's been looking over more of his files and also researching into Darge Asher for Picard. She says that she checked with Regulus, which sounds like a school, with Darge having been enrolled there. She finds out that Darge never actually attended the school and apparently her entire identity was built around 3 years ago in the year of 2396. We can safely presume this might also be when Darge and Soji were created. If so, we're getting more concrete dates as the series moves forwards. I can only hope that it sticks to this level of continuity. There's quite a few jumps here, so we move back to the Borg cube in which we finally see that Borg drones are being operated on by a rigid Romulan. This Romulan shows that we're not only going to see smooth four-headed Romulans, but also rigid ones as well, adding more continuity between the Romulans of the original Star Trek series and that of later series such as The Next Generation. While this Romulan Doctor, apparently, is removing elements of the Borg drone, we learn that they've assimilated so many species that some of the Alpha and Beta quadrants have never met. Any Borg they don't know the species of are called the Nameless. After the procedure, Darge goes over to the drone and says in Romulan, You are free now, my friend. Following this scene, we get more of a build up of this episode, mainly as Picard is standing in his study, thinking about his future, and most likely Darge and her sister, who he needs to find. As the clock strikes 2100 hours, Jean-Luc opens up his desk drawer and pulls out a tin containing his old Starfleet communication badge. Walking out and looking up at the stars, he taps a badge and hails Raffi Musica. From the Countdown comic, we know that Raffi is Picard's former first officer from when he commanded the USS Verity. The plot picks up even more pace as we go back to Starfleet headquarters. Admiral Clancy contacts Vulcan Commodore O informing her of a recent meeting which she had with Picard and the crazy theories he was spouting. I do get the impression that this Vulcan Commodore is part of Starfleet intelligence of some sort. She refers to Picard as the Hermit of La Barrere. La Barrere is actually the region in France where Jean-Luc Picard is from and where the vineyard is located. O hails for Lieutenant Rizzio and tells her to keep an eye on Picard and whatever he plans to do. It's revealed that Rizzo is actually a Zat Vash operative embedded into Starfleet and is somehow allied with this Vulcan Commodore. I do get the feeling that Admiral Clancy is unaware of his alliance between a Romulan and an apparent Vulcan. If so, something deeper is going on here. Back to Picard's vineyard, Lars is not exactly pleased when Picard reveals his plans to go out into space and find Bruce Maddox. It's sweet that Lars actually cares so much about Picard, and it really shows. Now one of my favourite things from this scene is where Zaban goes, you can't go without us, to which Lars overreacts and hits Shaban, telling them they can go and get themselves killed while she tends to the vineyard. This level of humour is quite fun because it's not that in-your-face humour, but casual stuff at the same time. 
Jaban actually makes a very good point of asking Jean-Luc if he can turn to any of his former crew members, naming Riker, Worf and LaForge. This actually confirms to us that George LaForge did not die in the attack on Utopia Planitia, as it was first contact day, he is probably celebrating on Earth or doing something else. Following this, Picard goes in search of Rafi Musica, where he visits Vaki's rocks. We've seen this location so many times as acting as alien planets in Star Trek history, but seeing on Earth is quite a change. Now on approaching this new habitat, Rafi comes out of a house with a phase rifle and basically tells Jean-Luc to get back on that taxi and fly away. There is something deeper going on here, as in the Countdown comic we see that their relationship is very friendly, but moving forward now we see their relationship has somewhat deteriorated rather rapidly. As Picard has his hands up in the air and is walking away, he simply says, Secret Romulan assassins are on Earth, which I did find quite humorous, as Rafi does as well, because she lowers a rifle and asks Picard if he brought the 86, which I would gather is a good year of Chateau Picard wine. Back on the Borg cube, as Narak is making notes on Darge's XB procedure, Lieutenant Rizio appears in hologram force, very similar to Shinzon's hologram in Star Trek Nemesis. She questions Narak's way of conducting this mission, to which Narak says that his approach is the best option at hand. Narak does make a rather objective comment on Rizio's look and appearance as a human, particularly saying that he does not like the round ears, and that she looks like a plucked Waylak, which is probably some kind of Romulan bird or at least a species on their former planet I'd imagine. Rizio then tells that Commodore O is an ally, making me think that she's not Romulan at all. We've had many examples of Romulans entering into conspiracy with Vulcans, most notable during Star Trek Enterprise's Cyrenite's arc in which one of the head of a Vulcan High Command, a Minister Vilas, was working with Romulan operatives to help them take over the Vulcan in some manner. This could be a similar situation, or perhaps Commodore O has a similar anti-Android sentiments to that of a Zat Vash, and that their only goal is to get rid of these new flesh and blood androids. Maybe to stop a repeat attack on Mars? If the Federation are scared about another attack, enlisting a secret order would make sense. We learn that Rizio and Narak are siblings, with Narak being their younger brother. What's even more interesting is that in the previous episode, Narak mentions that he has a younger brother, or rather had a younger brother as he apparently died last year. We know from this episode that Narak is very secretive, and that he's a member of a Zat Vash, so we can assume that he was lying, or at least telling half-truths. Now episode 2 of Star Trek Picard ends there. The episode was called Maps and Legends, Part of the title refers to the Telshar myth and the legend of the Zat Vash Order. Okay, now speaking about our review, overall I really enjoyed this episode. Seeing more of a Roman relocation fleet was a bonus for me, as I love seeing more details of Star Trek starships. Particularly this new type of Starfleet starship we've not seen before, I do hope we get to see a bit more of it, or at least a fleet in action, or maybe the actual destruction of the orbital shipyards. We've seen the destruction of Mars itself through, you know, the flashbacks from Children of Mars, and also flashbacks in this, but we've not seen much of the attack on the fleet itself. I want to see more of that. Now I'm really liking the feeling of this episode, straight away we're back into the action and plot and feeling of last week's premiere episode. I'm already excited and intrigued by what is coming up in episode 3 of the series, especially as I'm thinking that next week we'll meet Hugh for the first time in over 20 years. Following the little trailer we do get at the end of the episodes, we also meet Chris Rios next episode, and I'm excited to see how that goes. Picard is definitely trying to recruit people and put together a crew for his mission. World building and plot development seem to be the focus of this episode, which is great. The Talshar legend of a Zap Vash makes sense, and it's also very lore friendly. If you're wondering why we've never heard of him before in Star Trek history, then it's apparent in this episode. They're rarely mentioned and usually operate in intense levels of secrecy, and always clean up after their operations. Though maybe not in this case. The developments on the Borg Cube are surprising. I do think this is some way in Hugh's Borg Cube. The Romulans are assisting the Borg in some sort of way, by reintroducing them into a level of society by repairing what damage was done to them in the assimilation into the Borg Collective. How this is working and why the Romulans are doing this, I have no idea. It's highly unlikely that the Romulans decide to drop in and casually start helping, so there must be some sort of operation or ulterior motive going on here. Episode 2 does leave me with many more questions about what is going on. The Romulans are up to something, the Federation is up to something, and Picard has a brand new mission which looks to be taking back to the stars. As I mentioned, I'm very much excited for what's in store. Alright everyone, that does wrap up Trek Central's review and breakdown of Star Trek Picard Episode 2. Tomorrow on Friday the 31st, we'll be breaking down the episode even more, to further analyse those little details you might have missed. If you're looking for a more casual discussion of Star Trek Picard Episode 2, then feel free to tune in to Trek Central Live on Sunday at 9pm GMT. 
discussing all things Picard Episode 2 and what's to come later this season. If you like this video and want to keep up to date with all things Star Trek news, lore and more, then make sure to subscribe to Trek Central here on YouTube. You can also follow us on social media for daily updates, as well as visit our website for weekly articles. We're also now rolling out our community Discord server, so come and join the party ahead of the new series. Oh, and before I forget, CBS have actually put the first episode of Star Trek Picard on YouTube apparently. I'll leave a link down below. Currently, as I've got the information in front of me, it does look like it's only available to US viewers, but hey, it's worth a watch if you are in the US. You can get a taste of Picard, let me know what you think of it. For now, I've been Captain Jack, thank you for watching Trek Central, and I'll of course see you very soon.